Hey everybody, welcome to the finale of Bible Study Basics. Um, this is actually sort of the finale. I'm actually going to do another short little add-on video after this, um, but this is pretty much the finale. Okay, I'll tell you about that, that other video here at the end. Uh, but today is demo day, so we're going to take everything that we've talked about, uh, all these tips about how to study the Bible, and we're going to put them into action so you can kind of see how they work. Okay, uh, so I'm not going to do a recap because... I'm going to go through everything anyway, okay? So I'll go ahead and uh, dive into it. Uh, so today we're going to walk through, we're going to use uh, all this information um, to walk through two uh, passages. They're going to be very different uh, passages and, and different examples. So the first one is going to be 1 Samuel 17, okay? So that's the first one we're going to do. And so that one is a, a whole chapter it's in the Old Testament, and it's it's out of a narrative book. First Samuel is a narrative book, which means it's like storytelling, right? And um, and we're going to go through it as though it's part of your volume reading. So we're going to pretend you're in a volume reading plan, come to First Samuel 17, and that's how we're going to walk through it. Okay, so that's the first one. The other one is going to be very different. We're going to go through uh, Philippians 4.13, which instead of being a whole chapter, it's just a single verse, and it's in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. And it's in an epistle, which is uh, just a fancy name for a letter in the in the New Testament. Okay, um, and so it's not a narrative; it's a it's a letter. And um, we're going to go through that one as though it's part of your deep study. We're going to pretend like you're doing a deep study through the Book of Philippians, and you come to uh, chapter uh, four, verse thirteen. How you would uh, kind of walk through that. Okay, so we're going to I'm going to try to move quickly through all this. Obviously, we don't have time to cover everything, but I'm just going to move quickly through it so you can kind of get a feel for how this kind of works. Okay, so let's do First Samuel 17 first. Basically, First Samuel 17 is the story of David and Goliath. Okay which most of us know, um, but it's also misunderstood a lot of times. And a lot of y'all probably remember a couple of months ago, we actually went through this story in youth, okay? Um, but we're going to use it as an example here uh, as though you were doing it in your own Bible study. Okay? So step one in looking at this passage is looking at CIA, connect or context, and comprehend, okay? So understand what's going on around it and then what's going on within the text itself, okay? So if we look at the context, right, remember we're, we're trying to trying to see on all these layers, how is it fitting in with the story, right? So on the, the big layer of, of the whole story of the Bible, right? Remember the, the whole story of the Bible is about God redeeming his people and bringing us as humans back to himself, right? So you had, at the very beginning, you had Adam and Eve who were cast out of the land, right? Well, now you have this nation called Israel who's been brought back into a land, right? So God, when God raises up this, this nation of Israel and brings them into to this land, it's a picture of him reversing what had happened to Adam and Eve where they got cast out of a land, right? So whenever whenever you're reading through the story storyline of the Bible, right, you're gonna to come to the book of Joshua, right? Before we get to before we get to 1 Samuel, you come to the book of Joshua, right? And the, the, the whole point of the book of Joshua is they're going in and conquering the land that God has promised them, right? So they go in and do that, and then that takes us to a book called Judges. Right? And if you read the book of Judges, it's like mass chaos. Right, there, There's all sorts of craziness going on. And the, even though you have a single nation of Israel, there's 12 tribes. And all these 12 tribes are all acting. They're all kind of doing their own thing. They're very segmented. They're not unified at all. And so that's what's going on in, in the book of Judges. Well, then uh, you move into First and Second Samuel, right? And you might, if you're thinking, wait a minute, I thought Ruth came after the book of Judges. Well, Ruth happens during the time of the Judges, right? So, but So that's why I'm not including that, right? But you move after the time of the Judges, you move into where the story picks up in First and Second Samuel. So if, if the book of Judges is all sort of like chaos and disunity, in, in the book of Samuel, it's God's trying to bring unity under a, bring the whole nation unified under one king, okay? So the whole point of, of Samuel, First and Second Samuel, is like who's going to be the, the king, right? So that, that's kind of where we're at in the storyline of the Bible. Now, it's specifically with the book of Samuel, right? You might be a little weirded out whenever I just say the book of Samuel because they're like, there's First Samuel and Second Samuel. Well, here's, here's a fun fact for you, okay? When it was originally written, it was one book. Okay, it was just the book of Samuel. The reason why it's uh, First and Second Samuel in our Bibles is because when they originally read it, wrote when they originally wrote First and Second Samuel, um, they they wrote them on scrolls, and their scrolls were not long enough to be able to fit the whole thing on one scroll. So they split it up into two scrolls. 
that's why we have First and Second Samuel. But really, it's it's one continuous story, right? Same thing with First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. Okay, they're it's they're actually like it's actually one book, the Book of Samuel. Okay, so the the Book of Samuel, the whole point of it, if you look at it together, is who's going to be this king and representative who's going to unify the nation and lead the nation, right? And first, you see Saul, who is the king, and he fails, right? He fails like Adam had failed in the garden, right? So in the same way where where uh, Saul is the king and ruling representative of Israel and he fails, Adam had been the, the ruling representative of humanity and he fell and we fell with him, right? So, uh, so Saul's going to fail and be kind of like a picture of Adam, but then David's going to come along and he's going he's gonna to succeed as, as the king of Israel. And he's a picture pointing forward to Jesus where Jesus is going to succeed in a way that Adam had not succeeded, right? Now, of course, David is a sinful man, so he's only going to partially succeed, right? He's not Jesus. He's not perfect. He's going to fail a lot too, but he's pointing us forward to Jesus who is going to be perfect, right? So the main point of the, of the book of Samuel, so we have an understanding of the context that we're in, is who is going to succeed as Israel's king and representative? Who's going to go forth and, and rightly represent uh, the people of Israel? So now that we have an idea of uh, where we're at with the, the book of Samuel as a, as a whole, Let's zoom into the the chapter that we're at and kind of leading up to that. Okay, so we're uh, in Samuel, but specifically we're in verse or in chapter seventeen. But let's kind of back up to fifteen and sixteen because that kind of tells us where we're where we're leading up to, right? So in in chapter fifteen is where Saul is rejected by God. He keeps disobeying God over and over and over again, and so God says, "All right, fine, that's it. You're 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 out. Um, whenever like once you die, you're going to keep ruling Israel once you die or until you die. But after that, I'm going to strip the the kingdom away." from uh from your family and it's going to go to somebody else somebody else is going to replace you um and so which would have been a huge blow uh to Saul right so that so Saul's rejected in 15 and then chapter 16 is where God chooses David as as the next king right so that's what happens so that those two chapters where you see that happening in Saul's rejected and then David is brought in as as the the next upcoming king now in verse 17 or in chapter 17 now you you have this picture of these two guys in the same scene where you're, you're going to see where Goliath is coming out for looking for a challenger and you see Saul who's failing, the guy who was rejected, he's failing, but the guy who God has chosen, he steps up and he succeeds, okay? So that's how, that, how the context leading up to that kind of shapes the way that we understand the David and Goliath story, right? So now we understand how this chapter is, how this passage is fitting in with what's going on around it, right? So now let's zoom in and see uh, if we can comprehend and understand what's going on in the passage now that we know what's going on around it, right? So most of you know the story, but quick run through and recap, okay? So uh, David is, he shows up to a battlefield. You have Israel on a hillside on one side, a valley in the middle, and then Philistines are over here on this side. They're kind of facing off and, and doing this standoff type deal. And David is bringing supplies to his brothers who are in the Israelite army. He comes up to them and he sees them on, on both these sides. And uh, and Goliath has come out from the Philistines and he's yelled up at the at the Israelites. And he says, hey, why don't you come down here? We'll have a one-on-one -on -one match. And winner takes all, right? If I kill him, then, you, then the entire nation of Israel is going to serve us. But if he kills me, then our entire nation will serve Israel, right? And so the big question is, who is going to go out and represent Israel? And specifically, it's this this question between Saul and David. Who's going to go out and represent Israel? Because if you think about it, Saul is the most likely, the most logical choice, right? He's the most logical choice to go out and fight against Goliath because remember, if you've already been reading in 1 Samuel up to this point, you would have read where Saul is taller than anybody else in the nation of Israel. He, it said that he was a head taller than, than anybody else in, in the entire country, right? So Who's going to go out and fight this big, huge, tall guy? Saul's the logical choice, right? But he doesn't. He fails, right? He doesn't step up to the challenge, and he doesn't go out and successfully represent Israel and represent his people. David is the only one who's willing to do it. So David goes out, and he's willing to go out there not for his own fame, but for God's fame, right? So he goes out, and, and Saul tries giving him his, his armor and his sword, and David says, no, I'm going to take a sling instead, which we talked about when we went through this passage before. Remember, we talked about how that was actually a smart move because he, it was a, a way for him to kill Goliath without getting close to him, right, where he didn't have to get in close with a sword. And we also talked about how a sling wasn't a child's toy. It was actually a legitimate combat weapon in those days. There's other passages in the Bible that, that talk about it as a, as a legit combat weapon. 
And so David goes out there, he kills Goliath, and then he cuts off Goliath's head to prove that he killed him. And, and as soon as the Philistines see that, they turn around and start running away. Israel starts running after them, and they, uh, they slaughter a bunch of them, and they uh, come back, and they plunder their, uh, their camp. And so then Israel wins, okay? So that is what's going on. So now we understand what's going on in the passage and what, what's going on around the passage that, that informs that as well. So, big million dollar question, could you take a pop quiz on it? Yes, we could take a pop quiz on it. So we, we understand what's going on there. Now we get to step two where we're figuring out what does that mean, right? Interpreting, what does it mean? And remember, we always wanna know what's the main point, right? There's a lot of, always a lot of secondary points we can get, but what's the main point? And this passage is pretty cool because there's actually a verse in this passage that pretty explicitly spells out what the main point is, okay? If you go to verse 46 in chapter 17, it pretty much says explicitly what the whole point and the main, the, what the purpose is of this, uh, this passage. This is David talking to Goliath, okay? He says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. That, and he says, here's, here's the reason why I'm going to do this. He says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. But what David's saying is the whole purpose of all this is to show that God is who he says he is. To, to display to the nations, to all people, that the one true God is in Israel. Okay, So that's the main point. That's the whole purpose of this story is to, is to show God's glory to the nations. Okay, So whatever we're going through, just remember yesterday I, I talked about the sword method. We talked about how you don't have to use this, but this is, this is one tool that you can use if you want to uh, to work on interpreting the Bible, okay? So, if you remember the steps we went through, first of all, what is this passage saying about God? What, is, what does this passage tell me about God? Well, number one, it tells us that he's using Israel to make himself known to the whole world, okay? And it's not he's not doing that like an arrogant like an arrogant show-off, right? He's doing that, he's showing himself to all the nations through Israel because he's doing that to bring other other uh, people to himself, right? And the other thing that we learn about God in this is that he gets all the credit and the glory for this victory, right? David doesn't take credit for, for himself. He gives the, the, the credit and the glory to God, right? So then what does that tell us about, what does this passage tell us about other people, right? Well, if, if the whole point is for God to make himself known to other people, then what we know about other people, what it tells us about them is they need to know who God is, right? Like, that makes a whole lot of sense, right? So that's what it tells us about others. Now, uh, with with what it says about me and how it points us to Jesus, in this passage, it just so happens that both of these kind of work together, okay? So we kind of see both of these points at, at the same time, right? And uh, let me explain what I mean. In, in this passage, most of the time, we want to identify with David. We think that David represents us in the story, right? If you remember when we went through this before, where you talked about this, we think that David is us in the stories, right? So we're, we're like David, where it's like, you know, little guys can do big things too, and I can defeat the giants in my life, right? And I mean, there's like some truth to that. But that's not the point of the passage, right? David is not meant to represent us in the story. David is meant to represent Jesus, okay? So that's how he, that is how the story points to Jesus, is David is actually a picture of Jesus. Where we fit into the story, what this tells us about us, is that we're like the Israelites up on the hill, right? We're the Israelites standing here, and we have an enemy in front of us. Just like the Israelites had an enemy before them that they couldn't defeat they, they, they couldn't do that. They couldn't defeat the enemy before them. And so they needed a representative to go out and fight on their behalf, right? So David goes out, David steps up and he fights on behalf of the Israelites. And so when he is victorious, then they're victorious, right? They didn't do anything, but they win when he wins, right? So in the same way, we have sin in front of us and we can't defeat it. But Jesus goes out on our behalf and on the cross, he dies and he raises again and he defeats sin. And so when he is victorious over sin, we are victorious, right? So that's how it points us to Jesus, and that's what, what it tells us about ourselves, right? So now we understand what this story means, okay? We understand we understand the story, we understand what's going on around the story, and now we understand what it means. Now we move to the last part, right? And always remember, this is the last part, okay? We have to get to this point, but we want to get there last, right? 
or we step three we apply it, right where we're trying to understand how we're supposed to respond what what, what is it supposed to move us towards doing right so we do we want to think about about what uh, our head heart and hands right what is God telling us to know how should we think differently how should we value what how should our values change what should we think is important or how should we feel and then uh, what should we be doing as a result of this passage right so first of all uh, hey, what is God telling me to think or what is he telling me I need to know as a result of this passage? Okay, well, first of all, we need to know, we need to realize that God cares about making himself known, right? The whole point was for God to display his glory to the nation. So we need to understand that God cares about making himself known. And that's a good thing. That is good news because that means he's doing it so he can bring people to himself, right? Secondly, we need to realize that, again, we, we talk about as as like the, like the Israelites on the hill, we need to realize that we can't defeat sin on our own, but Jesus has already conquered sin for everyone who believes in it, right? So that's what we need to know. That's how we need to think as a result of this passage. Now, what do we need to value? What do we need to think is important? Or what, how, what should this make us feel, right? Well, one of, these, one of the things that this should make us feel is if we know that God cares about making himself known, then we should feel that same way. We should care about making God known, right? So that this moves us to feeling a certain way, right? Another thing that, that this should change our values about is that we should, just like David in the story, we should be angry at sin, right? David was angry at sin, but he was passionate about God. We should be the same way. We should be angry at sinful things, but we should be passionate about the God who's passionate about us, right? And so then that should move us to action. What should, our, what should we be actually doing? What our actions should be doing is, it, based on these other things, based on what we know what we value now, we should be making God's glory known, just like David was, but by, by going out and making disciples, that's the way we do that. We, we want to make God's glory known. And then also we want to fight against sin, right? Remember, the, the, if we're the Israelites in the story, what did they do at the very end? They went and they fought uh, against the Philistines. They chased down the Philistines and they fought against them, not in order to win the victory because David already won the victory. They went, they went and they fought against the enemy because they already had the victory, right? And so same thing for us. Jesus has already defeated sin. And so we simply go and fight against sin because he has already defeated it on our behalf so we can live in victory over sin and temptation, right? So that's what how it changes our actions, right? So these other things, I like checked them off as we went. This one, I'm not going to check it off, okay? Because it doesn't simply stop with knowing these things. It doesn't simply stop with knowing, oh, I should think this way. I should value this way. I should do this, right? It doesn't stop with just, I should do these things, but actually going and doing them. Right? So it doesn't stop here. It goes with actually going and actually applying it and being a doer of the word and not simply a hearer. Okay? So that is uh, how you do these steps. Uh, and obviously, we didn't have time to go through everything, but that is uh, 1 Samuel 17. So let me kind of reset here and we'll go back and quickly do uh, Philippians 4.13. This one should be uh, a little bit quicker. Um, but let me go back and we'll do Philippians 4.13. Okay, so same thing starting with uh, with uh, step one, context and comprehend. Okay, the, the context, think about the where this fits in, where the book of Philippians uh, fits in with the whole story of the Bible is where we're at in the storyline is this is after Jesus has already come. Jesus has fulfilled everything that the Old Testament was pointing to. He has come and he has saved humanity from sin to bring us back into relationship with God. And so before he ascends back to heaven, he sends out his followers to go and tell people about that, right? And so uh, Jesus' followers are going, they're spreading across the entire known world in order to spread the good news of Jesus. And as they're doing that, they're establishing these local communities of believers called churches, right? And so they're, as they're doing that, as they're establishing these churches, those churches need guidance and encouragement, especially in the midst of persecution, right? Most of them were being persecuted and suffering, so they need guidance and encouragement in the midst of that. So the apostles, who were kind of like the top church leaders that Jesus had appointed, like Paul, the, the apostles are writing letters to these churches to give them that encouragement and that guidance, right? So that's where we're fitting in with the whole, that, that's where it fits in on the storyline of the Bible, right? So you keep zooming in a little bit, specifically with the book of Philippians. Philippians is one of those letters, and it's from Paul to uh, the church and Christians who are in uh, the city of Philippi, which is why the book is called Philippians. They're in the city of Philippi, right? And so uh, that's what the book is about. And, the, and uh, the, the main point of the book, the main theme of the book is that Paul is encouraging them to uh, keep pursuing Christ and pursuing the example that, that Jesus has given them 
in the midst of difficulties, right? Even in the midst of suffering, he says, keep pursuing Jesus and uh, even even during persecution and, and suffering, right? And another thing when you're thinking about context, so you can think about other places in the Bible, right? So for Philippians, one thing you can do is you can go back and you can read Acts chapter 16, okay? In the book of Acts, it spells out, it, it gives us the story of how uh, the gospel was spreading, right? And how some of these churches were established. And you read about the church in Philippians whenever Paul established it, right? Whenever he first shared the gospel there. And you you actually find out that Paul himself suffered and was persecuted in Philippi, right? So now, years later, he's writing back to those same believers about them enduring persecution there, right? So that's a cool thing with some of these letters. You can go back and, and some of them you can read in Acts how, the, how they started and you can kind of get the background on it, right? Like we did that whenever we started our Ephesians study. That's what we did. We went back to and saw it in, in Acts. Okay, so that's where uh, that's how uh, the the book uh, that's the context that the book is giving us. Now specifically, the chapter we're in, we're in chapter four, which is the last chapter in the book of Philippians, and uh, and in this chapter, Paul is giving some final encouragement and. Uh, and he, he's, he's given some, some final guidance and encouragement. And one of the things that he says right before this verse is he tells them to set their minds on valuable, eternal things that matter rather than on these trivial things, right? And so set your mind on things that matter because that's going to enable you to endure suffering when you're focusing on the things that matter, right? So let me go uh, to uh, Philippians and read the last couple to give us a, the, the last bit of context here um, in Philippians 4, verse, we're in verse 13. But let me read the couple of verses right before that because we're trying to figure out context, right? So starting in verse 10, Paul says this. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. He says, I'm, I'm glad that you're, that you're concerned for me. He says, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. Right? He's saying, he's saying I'm, not, I'm not complaining or asking something from you. That's not what I'm saying. Because he says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right. So that's the context that's leading right up to the verse that we're in, right? That's So Paul's talking about being content. So now we have an idea of the context, what's leading up, how the, how this verse fits in with, what, with what's around it, right? So we've done that part, right? So now that we know what's going on around it, now we need to say, okay, like, do we understand what's going on in the verse, right? Which for this, pretty short and simple, right? Pretty straightforward. Paul's saying, I'm able to do all things, not because of my strength, but because Jesus is the one strengthening me, right? It's a pretty simple verse, pretty straightforward, okay? So for in this case, that's a pretty quick step, right? Can we take a pop quiz on this, on what's in it and what's around it? Yeah, right? So comprehending, understanding what Paul is saying, that's a pretty quick step. That's pretty easy. Where it gets tricky is step two, right? Interpreting it. This is where so many people trip up on this verse and we misinterpret it, right? Partially because we don't pay attention to the context, right? That's why we need to do all this first, right? So now we get into, we know what Paul said, but what does it mean? When he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, what does that actually mean, okay? Here's not what it means, okay? Paul, it does, it does not mean that Paul can do anything that he puts his mind to uh, because Jesus is his little sidekick, and so Jesus is going to help him do whatever Paul puts his mind to, right? If Paul uh, sets his mind to something and sets his own agenda and his own goals, then Jesus is going to come along and just be okay with whatever Paul wants to do and equip him and strengthen him to be able to do whatever Paul wants to do. That is not what Paul's saying, okay? Again, you got to keep the context in mind, right? What, what were those verses saying leading right into verse 13, okay? The context was Paul was talking about being content in every circumstance. He was talking about how he had been suffering before, right? And he's saying, whatever circumstance, whether I'm in a good circumstance or a negative circumstance, I know that I can, that I can endure that because Christ is giving me the strength to endure it, right? So what he's saying, it, what it means, the way you interpret this verse is because of the strength that Jesus provides, Paul can endure anything for the sake of the gospel, that he can be content in any circumstance, right? This isn't, this isn't a set your mind to whatever you want and Jesus is going to come alongside and, and, and equip you to 
go win a football championship, right? That's what a lot of people apply it to, right? That's not what it's talking about. It's saying you can endure for the sake of the gospel because Jesus equips you to do that, okay? So that's what it means, okay? Now we understand what it means, okay? So we've interpreted it correctly. We've understood it. We've interpreted it right. So how does it apply to us, okay? Again, doesn't apply so much for football games, right? I, when I was an athlete, I used to have this verse in mind, and most of the time I had it in, I was thinking of it in terms of sports, right? That is not the primary way that you apply this, okay? This this verse actually applies more to like persecuted Christians around the world, right? If you if you listen to stories of persecuted Christians around the world, one thing that is that is consistent for all of them is their content, right? You, you, it's, it's crazy. They're totally content in whatever circumstances they're in, even though they're suffering, because of what Paul's talking about in Philippians 4.13. They're experiencing the same thing that, that Paul experienced, right? So how does this affect our head, heart, and our hands? How does this... How does this because of this verse, how should we? what do we need to think or what do we need to know, okay? What we need to know is we need to know that Jesus is generously providing strength for us in our time of need, right? That's what Paul's saying. We need to know that Jesus is generously doing that, okay? So that's what we need to know. How does that affect what we value or what we feel, what we, what we think is important? Well, for one, the way that it should affect us in the way that we feel is if we know that Jesus is strengthening us, then that should make us feel strengthened and encouraged, right? That makes sense, right? So that's what we should feel. And then also it should make us value the gospel, right? Like we should value the gospel enough to be willing to suffer for it the way that Paul was talking about right here, right? That we value it enough because we know that if we do that, Jesus is going to give us the strength to do that, right? So that's what, that's our head and our heart. Now, our hands, what do we actually do, right? What is this verse challenging us to go and do? How do we go out and, and apply this with what we actually do? We work hard to advance the gospel, right? Even whenever it means suffering or being made fun of, because we know that Christ is going to strengthen us in the middle of it, and we know that the gospel is valuable enough to do it, we go and we advance the gospel as a result of that, right? So, that leaves us hanging out here. Are we going to actually go and do that? Are we going to actually, are we going to stop here with knowing we should do that? Or are we going to actually go out and do that. So that's how you do that with Philippians 4.13. Uh, so now with two very different uh, passages, one a longer passage from the Old Testament, one a single verse from the New Testament, you've seen these steps in action, right? Again, we had to go through it really quickly, uh, but comment down below and let me know if this was helpful or if you have any questions. Uh, and uh, I'm also going to do an add-on video that will uh, release later today um, that's going to have some helpful tools to help you in Bible study. If you find it difficult to, to study the Bible, hopefully this is, has helped you, but there are also like some other tools and stuff that you can use alongside your, your Bible study to, to kind of help you make it a little bit easier and simpler. Okay, so check that video out as well. Uh, and uh, continue as you're as you're studying your Bible, continually ask questions about how you can do it better. Okay, this this is something that you continue to grow in and get better at. You don't you don't stop getting better at, at studying the Bible. Okay, so uh, thank y'all for watching these videos, and we'll see you later.